Thanks so much, Michael. Good morning, everyone. Once again, today, I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Paula Shrewsbury to the Montgomery County Master Gardeners. Paula is a professor and extension specialist in Ornamental and Turf IPM with the Department of Entomology at the University of Maryland. She has worked with the green industries for over 25 years. Paula conducts applied research and extension education programs on IPM. The overall focus of her program is to create sustainable landscapes, nurseries and turf systems with an emphasis on biological control, conservation of beneficial arthropods and management of invasive species. Paula is a longtime contributor to the University of Maryland Extension IPM Alert weekly newsletter, which many of you receive. Today, Paula will be presenting to us on the topic of using signs and symptoms to diagnose plant damage caused by insects. In this talk, you'll learn to use signs and damage symptoms to determine what insect is causing damage to your plants. Welcome, Paula, over to you. Thanks, Renu, very much. Um, let me just do a share screen here. All right, so good morning, everybody. It's so nice to um, be here and get to interact with you guys again. It's always a pleasure. You're a great group of, of people and master gardeners. And um, as Renu said, I'm going to talk about um, ways to use signs and symptoms to diagnose plant damage caused by insects. And um, I thought that since the growing season is starting and you guys are master gardeners, I thought this would be a good refresher um, in preparation for your upcoming plant clinics and other activities that you guys do because diagnosing plant problems are and, and making recommendations on how to, to either prevent them or, or reduce them um, is a major part of what you do. So hopefully you'll learn a lot from this and we'll have some good questions and interaction. Um, so again, if you, you recall, there are many possible causes of plant damage and accurate identification of the cause of the damage is critical to have good plant management programs. So again, in this talk, you're going to learn about insect signs and plant damage symptoms and how you use that information to determine what, um, what, what the causal agent of the problem was. So proper identification is going to allow you to learn more about the pest and come up with the best strategy for managing that pest and to make recommendations on managing that pest. So today I'm going to start off by um, talking about diagnosis of plant problems. Then I'm going to go through and review different plant damage types. And then we're going to do some practice diagnostics at the end. So when we think about the causes of plant damage, um, they can either be abiotic or biotic. And abiotic causes can be poor soil conditions, drought, stress, cultural issues, physical um, issues, pollution, things like that that, can, that are abiotic and they can cause your plant to be unhealthy. Then there are biotic um, agents or causes. These can be insects and mites, which is what we're going to focus on today, but also pathogens, so diseases, weeds, rodents, and, and other living biotic causes. And the interesting thing is um, I've talked to Dr. Karen Rain, who runs our plant diagnostic clinic at the University of Maryland, and she said that most of the problems that she gets into her um, plant clinic are abiotic pro problems. So keep that in mind when you're interacting with, um, with your clients that you're, you're trying to help, that a lot of times the problems are abiotic before they, they would even be a biotic problem. Now, when we think about diagnosing plant problems, we need to think about plant damage symptoms and insect signs. So we're gonna be looking for those. We wanna learn, we wanna be able to identify the insect that's causing the damage. So the causal agent. So my first question is why is identification important? And when you think about um, the pest or the problem that, that, that's be, the cause of the problem, um, not all control measures work on all pests, so you want to make sure you identify the pest correctly. Um, 
pests have varying windows of vulnerability or varying life cycles. So their window of vulnerability is going to vary. It might be their early first instar, like the crawler stage of, of um, scale insects or early young caterpillars are the most susceptible stage. So again, knowing what that is, is important. Um, they vary in when that vulnerable life stage happens. The pest you see may not be the agent that's causing the problem. So it may not actually be a pest insect at all. It may be a beneficial, or it could be an insect that's not, do, that it does something else and not the damage that you're seeing. And then by identification of the problem or the causal agent, you can gain knowledge. You can go to your resources, and that's gonna allow you to more effectively manage your pest problem. And when we think about plant problems and insects, Remember, almost all insects feed, and because of that, they leave behind signs or symptoms indicating that they've been on the plant. So basically, you become detectives looking at these signs and symptoms, the clues, trying to figure out what, what's causing the damage that you're seeing. And you can see in these images that I have up here in the turf, you have browning of the turf, but that could be biotic, it could be abiotic, it could be um, diseases, it could be insects. So you need to gather more information. So you look closer and try to get, gather other clues. Um, up here on the left, you have dieback of, of tree branches. That's not normal. And you need to think about what, you need to look for other signs and symptoms of what could be causing that dieback. And then here on the corn um, leaves in the middle, you can see, not only do you see the defoliation that's being caused by the insect, but you can actually see <clears throat> excuse me, the frass left behind, and <clears throat> excuse me, in this case, a caterpillar actually there. So when you're looking at plants and their damage, <clears throat> you don't always see the actual insects. So a lot of times people will bring samples into your clinic and they'll say, what's causing this plant to look like this? But there's no insects or, or signs of, or there's no insects left on that plant. It's already done its thing and moved on, or they didn't take a sample that included that. So that's why you need to look for these other clues as to what could be causing the damage. And what I want to do now is just kind of go through the steps to pest identification and diagnostics. And the first thing you want to do is to know the plant. Okay, know what the plant's supposed to look like. What's, it, what's the healthy plant look like? So know what's normal. And then also know what some of the common or key problems of that plant are. And if you look at the examples up here, here you have a poinsettia. Um, is it supposed to have yellow leaves like that or not? Yeah, for this one, it's a variegated variety. It's supposed to look like that. Look at the pumpkin. A pumpkin supposed to look like that? Well, they develop cultivars that have all these little bumps and stuff on them. So that is normal. That's not a disease or an insect that's causing that. And then on the left are these white pines. And you can see the older needles of all of the branches are turning yellow. And it's happening on, on all of the white pines in this image. Is that normal or not normal? Well, the answer to that one is it depends on the time of year. So in the fall, it's normal for pines to lose their older needles. That happens all the time. But if this was happening in the spring or the early middle of the summer, then that's probably something else causing that. But in the fall, that's normal for the plant to do that. So knowing this is important too. So knowing something about the plants. The other thing you wanna do when you're trying to diagnose a problem is to check for patterns in where the damage is occurring. So you wanna kind of step back if you have the opportunity to look at the entire planting or landscape and see how the plants look in general. You want to then get, get a closer look and see how the entire plant looks, and then even individual parts of the plant and how they look and what types of signs or symptoms you're seeing. And if you look at this, I've just kind of summarized um, different characteristics of infectious types of problems caused by diseases or insects or non-infectious or abiotic problems. So if the pattern you're seeing is random in its distribution, of where this of the symptoms, or it's probably caused by a biotic problem. If it's more uniform in its distribution, it's probably caused by an abiotic problem. If you're only, if only the damage is only affecting one plant species, 
and not all plants are showing the symptoms, it's probably a biotic problem or cause. If you're seeing it on different plant species and it's frequently um, showing up on, on lots of different types of plants and, and injury on different plant parts, then um, it's probably an abiotic cause. And we see that a lot with herbicides. So if you think about herbicide damage, it's not going to affect just one plant part. It's going to affect, or one plant species, it's going to affect different plant species in that landscape. Okay. And then you also want to make note, are the symptoms spreading over time? If so, if it's getting worse or spreading, it's probably a biotic cause. If it tends to not progress and it stays the same over time, then it's probably an abiotic cause of that damage symptom. And these are just general guidelines that I, I've put up here. Um, it's not something that there, there, well, there are definitely exceptions to all the rules, as you've probably learned already when it comes to, to plant management. So one of the other steps is to um, search for signs of insects, so signs of the pest, and damage symptoms. And just to clarify what these are, signs and symptoms, the sign is the pest organism itself. So it's the insect itself, it's exoskeleton, maybe a product that it produces like wax or frass. Those are signs that you're looking for, signs of the insect. And then there are symptoms, which you're also looking for. And these are actually, this is actually the injury caused by the plant or it's a response of the plant to the pest feeding on it or being on it. So you're looking for those damaged symptoms. And when we monitor for signs and symptoms, um, I'm just gonna give you a little example of how you might approach it. So you go up to a landscape or maybe your clients bring you pictures of their landscape and they say, I have this tree. It's got, look at how, you know, what's going on with it and you look and you can see dieback of the branches. Well, one of the first things you wanna know is what plant is it, what tree is it, okay? And with this particular tree, it's an ash tree, and hopefully your client will know what tree it is. Otherwise, you're gonna to have to figure out what the tree is, so you'll get better at plant identification. Um, and, and like I said, this is an ash tree. You then wanna look at the pattern. Is it only on this one tree, or is it on other trees? And you can see there are a couple ash trees, ash trees in this planting also, and they also have died back. Okay. But I see other trees in the background of different species and they don't have the died back. You're gonna look for other signs and symptoms. If you look at the bark of the tree, you see this splitting, okay? And this is another damaged symptom. If you look more closely, you're gonna see these holes we call them exit holes in the tree. And this particular hole ha has a unique shape. It's flat on one side and rounded on the other, and we call these D-shaped holes. Over here, um, this is damage caused by woodpecker feeding. So a woodpecker has been pecking at this tree, and we know that woodpeckers pecking at trees, they're usually going after some type of insect in there. And if we peel barks back some of the dead bark, you see these galleries underneath. So all of these signs and symptoms indicate that there's some type of wood boring insect damaging that tree. And wood boring insects can cause dieback of the branches and ultimately death of the tree. And if you go to your resources and you look up ash trees and wood boring insects, you're gonna find that one of the more common ones that we see are or is the emerald ash borer. There's also another borer um, that gets in it too, but the symptoms are different. The boring symptoms are different. So um, you would then look up emerald ash borer. You would learn more about its biology, when it's active, when the best time to make control um, or implement control tactics are, and then also what life stages to target the vulnerable life stages. So you would learn all of that once you get the proper identification. So again, when you're trying to, to um, diagnose plant problems, you wanna also ask a lot of questions, okay? So first you're gonna ask, what's the host plant, okay? Then you wanna know when did the symptoms first appear? What are the main symptoms that the client's seeing or from the samples you have or the pictures they're sharing with you, what are, what are they seeing? Um, have there been any fertilizers or pesticides used on that plant or in that vicinity, like herbicides or other types of, of products? 
Um, are any of the other plants affected? If so, which varieties or species are affected? What's the pattern of the damage like I talked about? And then what are the environmental conditions? Are we in the middle of a drought? Um, is there construction going on nearby which could be compacting soil or damaging roots of trees or has in the last year or so there have been recent construction going on? So these are all types of information you need to gather and it's gonna help you um, or better inform you so that you can make a better diagnosis. You, um, gather this information, then you can go to your resources and find out more. You can figure out if you know the host plant, like with the ash, you go to your resources and you can figure out what the key pests of the, the ash tree is or whatever the tree, tree sample of the plant is you're looking at. Okay, What damage symptoms and insect signs look like for the major pests or key pests of that plant? When are those key pests active? What life stage is the most damaging out of those key pests and what's the vulnerable life stage? Okay, so again, you gather information, it's gonna help you determine what's next and what you should be recommending to your clients. Some of the resources that you might, might use, there are textbooks out there. There are a number of University of Extension services um, that you can use, publications, websites, electronic newsletters, the diagnostic clinic that we have. Um, and then there are a number of web resources. And when you're going to the web to find information, make sure you use reputable sources. Um, you don't wanna use um, my name's Joe and I love bugs website because we don't know if what they are putting up on that site is, is verified information. Um, a lot of your .edu extension or .gov extensions are, are validated um, information in those sites. So for example, um, Mike Raup and John Davidson, who are from our department, the Department of Entomology at the university, they publish a book called Managing Insects and Mites on Woody Plants and IPM Approach. This was put together to target more commercial landscapers, but the information that's in here is very relevant to what you need to know as master gardeners, both in terms of identification of pests, but also in their management using IPM practices. So you can get this um, bulletin or this book on um, line from TCIA, which is the Tree Care Industry Association. And if you go to their website, you can um, work your way through the website and find that resource. It's a really good one. The other one is the IPM newsletter that we put out through UME. I'm part of this. I write the weekly beneficial of the week in addition to contributing other information. Um, this is spearheaded by Stanton Gill, who some of you may know. And then there are several other of us in extension who contribute to this, including some of the master gardeners um, in the state and other um, practitioners, um, landscapers, arborists, nursery growers who contribute to it. So this is free. If you don't get it, you should definitely get it. I imagine most of, of you get this, but if you need to get it you to sign up for it, it comes out every Friday. We just started two weeks ago, um, and this will go usually through in, into November. So you can go to this web link um, at extension.umd.edu slash IPM, and there's a place on there, a link that you can, that allows you to sign up and put in your email so you get the um, PDF of this every week, or you can go to the, the link and you can actually see archives of past reports. Okay. Or you can email Suzanne Click at sclick at umd.edu and ask her to put you on the, on the listserv for this newsletter. So it's really great. It gives you timely information on what's occurring um, throughout the state and the region um, and that you should be aware of. And when you're doing plant clinics, it's really good to read this and know what's current and active. So you'll have a good idea of what plant samples you're gonna be getting into the clinic that week. Okay, it's a really good resource. In addition to that, we also um, on that website, the UMD um, IPM NAP horticulture website, um, we have something called the pest predictive calendar. And this includes names of plants and pests and degree day information on when those plants are active and plant phenological um, indicators as to when certain pests in their susceptible stages are active. This is a um, resource that's been evolving over several years. Um, Nancy Harding is my assistant. She's my faculty um, assistant and she is one of the Master Gardener interns this year 
um, this season with you guys at Montgomery County. So um, hi, Nancy, I imagine you're out there. Um, and Nancy works really hard to keep this um, past predictive calendar updated and she's continuing collect, continually collecting information, adding to this calendar. So she does a really nice job with that. And this is another resource. Um, I don't have time to go into detail, but if you want to discuss at the end, degree days and plant phenological indicators, we can do that. These are also some really good um, websites where you can get good images of insects and they, the identifications have been verified. Um, you, you do all have a PDF of this PowerPoint, so you should be able to find that in the PDF, um, all these resources. But again, you think you know the identification of an insect or you're trying to confirm it, these are good resources to go to. Bug of the week, Mike Raup, um, an entomologist extent and extension specialist in our department, the bug guy, he puts out a bug of the week, a new episode comes up every Monday. This is a good place to go to learn um, really good information and some interesting stories about different insects, many of which are, are current in the time that he publishes them. And he has a YouTube as part of this, which has some really great videos of insects. So that's kind of the steps to diagnosing a plant problem and then different resources that you might use to help you with those um, diagnostics and, and, and identifying what the causal agent of the problems are. What I wanna do now is to go through and talk about damage types. Okay. There, are, there are different types of damage caused by different insects and knowing what those damage types are and what groups of insects may cause those damage types will also help you to diagnose who the causal agent is of the problem. And when we think about plant damage symptoms caused by insects and mites and their signs, remember all insects feed and therefore leave behind some type of sign or damage symptom that they've been on that plant. I already said that once, but I wanna repeat it. Also remember that a single pest, so a single species of pest can cause symptoms or signs in more than one category. So more than one type of, of category. So for instance, you might have a pest that causes stippling to the foliage but it also may leave behind webbing, or it also may leave behind frass on the plant to help you collect enough information to figure out what that pest is. In addition, the same symptom can be caused by more than one plant. So I showed you a picture of dieback of branches of trees. Well, that could be caused by, by more than one pest. It could be a borer, like I showed you in the example that can cause dieback. It could be a root feeding insect that can cause dieback of branches. So again, it's collecting as many of the signs and symptoms as you can, learning as much about the plant as you can, and figuring out what the causal agent is of that particular um, sample that you're looking at. And let's think about the mouth parts of insects because the type of mouth part an insect has, the um, more like the different damage it's gonna cause. Okay, and there are multiple types of mouth parts out there, but many of the insects we interact with will have chewing mouth parts or plant sucking, piercing sucking mouth parts. And these are the general mouth parts of an insect. So here's the head view with the antennae up here in the eyes. And insects have what are called a labrum, which is analogous to our upper lip. They have a labium, which is analogous to our lower lip, which helps to manipulate food. Um, they have maxillae, which come in from the side, and it helps them to um, manipulate their food, move it into their mouth. And then they have mandibles, which are analogous to our molar teeth, except mandibles work this way, our teeth work this way, and it's for macerating their food, okay? The plants or the insects, if they're predators, that they're feeding on, okay? And they can, chewing insects chew on foliage, either externally or internally as leaf miners. They can feed on flowers, they can feed on plant stems or wood under the wood, on the cambium or on the heartwood, and then they can also feed on roots. So chewing damage to those different types of plant parts. The other most common type of, of mouth part are the piercing sucking mouth parts. And here you have the head of an insect, the antennae going up here, the eyes. Down here, you have what's called the 
proboscis, which is the mouth part of the sucking insect. Um, within that proboscis is resting what are called stylets, and stylets come together to form um, the mouth parts. And stylets are made up of, of the mandibles and the maxillae. And if you do a cross section of the stylets, you see those parts, but basically it's forming a tube-like structure that gets inserted into the leaf, or if it's a predator into another insect, and it injects um, salivary enzymes or enzymes into that plant or insect to liquefy it so it's easier for it to suck up. And these sucking mouth parts can go into different parts of the plant and you're going to get different damaged symptoms depending on where it goes into. So for example, if you look at this cross section of the leaf up here, sometimes the mouth parts will be inserted into the leaf and they'll go into the cells and it will suck, it will suck out cell content. And when it sucks out cell content, it's removing the chlorophyll and that results in stippling, little yellow spots on the surface of the leaf. Sometimes for certain insects, instead of feeding on the cells, they will go into the xylem and phloem tissue. So insects that feed on the phloem sap of plants, <clears throat> which move through the leaf and also move through the stems and bark of, of the tree, they often excrete what we call honeydew because they suck up so much phloem sap, they excrete honeydew, and I'll show you pictures of this, and then black sooty molds grow on that, grow, grows on that honeydew. So again, specific symptoms that you're gonna see. Other sucking insects, when they feed, they, there's an interaction between hormones that they put into the plant, and it causes the plant to grow, to grow, and they often feed on meristematic tissue, so actively growing tissue, so buds, um, roots of plants um, under the, at the bark of the tree where there's actively growing tissue under the bark. So again, and that causes galling, so deformation of the plant. So you might get galling or deformation by some of these sucking insects also. So again, depending on where they're feeding and whether they have sucking or chewing mouth parts, you're going to get different damage symptoms. You think about the different orders or groups of insects. There are about 29 orders of insects and then the mites, which can also cause damage. But we basically, there are six or seven groups of insects or orders of insects that we most commonly encounter causing damage to our plants. Okay. Um, and you can see here, I've put the group of insects. So there's a, an order called Hemiptera, which has three subgroups as part of it, the true bugs, the hoppers, and then another group that the aphids or scales and some other kind of miscellaneous looking insects, but they all have sucking insects, I mean sucking mouth parts. And then down here with the thrips, they also have a suck, sucking type mouth part and spider mites, which have sucking type mouth parts. They're going to have very different damage than these other groups of insects that have chewing type mouth parts. Our beetles, our caterpillars, our sawflies and our immatures of our fly, our fly larvae, they all have chewing mouth parts. Okay. So what I wanna talk about now are the different um, damage categories. And then within each of those five categories, there are different types of damage. Okay. So there's the chewed, chewed, discolored, distorted, dieback and products of insects. So kind of remember the C, the three Ds and the P. And within the chewed category, there are different types of chewing damage, and we'll go over these. There are different types of discoloration, different discolor damage, and so forth. And what I'm gonna go do is go through each of these different groups and the different types and give you examples of it, and the types of insects that might cause that type of, that category and type of damage. So we're gonna start with the chewed damage and the different categories. Um, and defoliation, shot holes, notching of leaf margins, skeletonization, and etching. Insects that cause these types of damage are the larvae of moths and butterflies, so the caterpillars, the sawfly larvae, immatures or larvae of beetles, and adults of beetles. And then there are some other miscellaneous things like tree crickets and grasshoppers and walking sticks that can cause this. And then some non-insects, non the snails and the slugs. So when you see this type of damage, 
this type of chewing damage. It's going to be one of these groups of organisms that, that are causing that damage. So when you're trying to figure out the causal agent, if it's defoliation, you can narrow it down to one of these groups of insects. So here we see small holes, sometimes referred to as shot holes, and a little bit larger holes, the other shot holes are the beginning of de defoliation. And in this particular case, there are small caterpillars doing it. These are gypsy moth caterpillars, but this is damage often caused by small caterpillars. So somebody brings you in a sample, it's got this type of damage that should, should suggest to you that it's potentially young or small caterpillars causing that damage. As those caterpillars get bigger, the damage becomes significant defoliation. And you can see here that you have the, default, the foliage chewed all the way down to the petiole of the leaf. So defoliation caused by larger caterpillars. Then you get these smaller holes, another type of shot hole damage that you might see here and here. And again, beetles, okay, there is something called a flea beetle that causes the damage you see on the left. And then small caterpillars or beetles also here too that you might see. But again, you're narrowing down the possible causal agents of the damage that you're going to see. Agworms can cause shot holes, these small holes when they're young. When they get bigger, they will cause defoliation where they will defoliate entire branches. Um, this is another type of damage called skeletonization, and this is intervenal feeding. So the insects, mouth parts, the mandibles, again, chewing mouth parts, these chewing mouth parts aren't strong enough to cut through the veins of the leaf. So they feed between the veins of the leaf on the tissue between the veins. And that's referred to as skeletonization. We see it often with Japanese beetle damage. Okay, this is quite common. Then we have something called etching, which is similar to skeletonization, but it only goes through one layer of the leaf. So there's an upper and a lower leaf surface or layer, and sketch, etching is just when one layer of the leaf is removed, and it's also intervenal feeding. So again, they're not cutting through the veins, they're not going all the way through because they're small. And these, this is often caused by beetles, or small or young caterpillars. So this is oak skeletonizer. And even as a mature caterpillar or, or the late instar caterpillar, it's still quite small. And this is the type of damage that you're gonna see. Okay. Etching, this damage is called leaf etching. The edges of the leaves have these little notches or, or I'm sorry, not etching, leaf notching, sorry, leaf notching. So the edges of the leaf have these little notches. And the insect that causes this are weevils, okay, the adult weevils. Adult weevils are a type of beetle, and there are different species of weevils, but they always cause this leaf notching. So if you see leaf notching like this, it's from a weevil. So again, you're, you're narrowing down the possible causal agent. So somebody brings you in a rhododendron, it's got leaf notching to the foliage. You're gonna Google, go online and look at Google rhododendron, leaf notching, insect. Right? And then you're going to come up with different potential weevils that could be attacking that rhododendron. Okay, So you can gather more information to help with the management and the recommendations that you're going to make. The only other insect that causes what you might confuse with notching are leafcutter bees. But they're, um, they cause circular, um, very discrete circular notches or uh, cuttings into the edge. So they take these discs of leaf and they bring it back to their nest, which they line these galleries within wood or, or other plant tissue. And they lay their, they bring pollen and lay their eggs in there. So that's why they're cutting these, these little discs of leaves out. Now the next category of damage is discoloration. Discoloration can be stippling, streaking, leaf mining, or just overall yellowing of the leaf. And the groups of insects that cause types of discoloration are um, the stippling can be caused by lace bugs, leaf hoppers, plant bugs, and some others, and also spider mites. And I'll show you images of what stippling looks like. A streaking um, leaf mining can be caused by a diversity of insects. So some of our flies are leaf miners. Um, some of our soft flies, which are a, a primitive um, hymenoptera, uh, <clears throat> can also cause leaf mining, some of our beetles and some of our caterpillars. 
and then yellowing from other, some of our in other sucking insects, aphid scale psyllids can cause yellowing of the leaf tissue. Okay. So sucking mouth parts for stippling, streaking, leaf mining is more chewing mouth parts, and then the yellowing is more sucking mouth part insects. Here we have stippling, so little yellow dots. So think about it, where do you think these, that the insect that causes stippling damage feeds? Remember I talked about cell feeders, the sucking mouth part going into the individual cell, sucking out cell contents. So in this example, it's caused by spider mites. Now, how do you know that spider mites and not some other cell sucking insect? Well, you're gonna look for other signs and symptoms. So you're gonna look for the actual insect or mite on the plant. And if you looked at the underside of these leaves, you might see the actual mites or eggs by the, left by the mites on that plant. Or maybe the mites are done and they've gone off. Okay, they've, they've finished their development and they've gone. But if you look harder, you may see shed skins left behind by the mite or even fine webbing um, that can be left behind by spider mites. Okay, so you're looking for different damage signs and symptoms left behind. I mean, damage symptoms and signs of the insect or mite left behind to give you a big, a conclusive picture of what the, um, the problem is. And this is stippling on, a, on an evergreen or spruce. Okay, you can see the stippling of the needles. You can see um, shed skins on here. And if you look um, good, you may even see some fine webbing on here indicating spider mites. Here we have stippling caused um, by an insect with a sucking mouth part. Um, in this case though, you're gonna look for other signs and symptoms. So you figure out what the plant is. This is an azalea. And you look under azaleas and key sucking pest or stippling by insects and azalea. If you Google that online, you search your resources, it's gonna come up with lace bugs. Okay, lace bugs are a sucking insect. And then if you look at other signs and symptoms for lace bugs, you're going to see that lace bugs also leave behind this black, these black droplets called frass or it's their feces. Okay, so with lace bugs, you have stippling, you have feces on the underside of the leaf, and you may or may not see adults or immature lace bugs. This is another stippling. This one's caused by leaf hoppers. Okay, leaf hoppers are, are another sucking insect. You may see shed skins left behind for the leaf hopper. So stippling, some shed skins. Leaf hoppers are bigger than mites, so they're gonna be a larger shed skins. Mites are usually very abundant, so you'd have lots of shed skins. Leaf hoppers, often there's one or two or three on a leaf, but not 50 on a leaf, like with mites. Also, you're not gonna see webbing, and you're not gonna see those fecal spots on the underside of the leaf. So again, you're gonna know it's not a spider mite, it's not a um, lace bug. Another type of discoloration are necrotic spots. There's an insect called a four-line plant bug that inserts its mouth parts into the, the leaf tissue. It injects enzymes, which causes necrosis of the cells, the tissues right around where the feeding is happening, and you get these necrotic spots. Again, another type of damage by sucking insects. This is what we call streaking, which is damaged by thrips. And thrips, it's, it's similar to stippling, but it's a little bit more elongate. And thrips also leave behind these little black fecal spots too. And thrips are much smaller than lace bugs. So if you're gonna know the difference between thrips fecal spots and lace bug fecal spots. Another type of discoloration is the um, leaf mining. And there's different types of leaf miners and caused by different insects. Here, there's a leaf miner, which is a type of fly. The adult fly lays her eggs on the leaf, the egg hatches, and then the larvae of the fly, the immature, feeds between the upper and leaf surface of the leaf, causing a mining, leaf mining damage. And here, this is called a serpentine leaf mine. You can see it started here. And then as the larvae feeds in between the leaves there, it gets wider and wider because the larvae is feeding, growing, molting, and growing. So you end up with that. And if you flip open or peel back some of these leaf mines, you might see the larvae or the pupae in that leaf mine. Or you may not if it's already emerged out. Another type of leaf mine are called blotched mines. And this is on birch, a birch leaf miner. So the mines have different patterns to them. So host plant, whether it's serpentine or blotched, can all help you to 
identify um, what that insect is, what that cause of the problem is. The other, um, the other category is distortion. So leaf cupping or deformation, which can be caused by aphids or psyllids. And again, insects feeding on meristematic actively growing tissue. So leaf, um, so the buds of plants, newly expanding leaves. That's where these guys are gonna be feeding new leaves and you're gonna end up with cupping and deformation. There are the gall makers and there are a number of different insects and mites that can cause galls. And we'll look at leaf galls and, and stem galls in a minute. And then we saw a picture of rock cracking already. So rippling or cracking. And that's usually caused by either boring beetle insects or boring caterpillar insects. And again, sucking mouth parts for these um, leaf cupping and deformation, um, chewing for the boring. And then um, these may vary on the type of ball maker that's causing it. So here we have distortion of the new foliage. You see distortion, that's gonna tell you a sucking insect feeding on the growing, actively growing tissue. You're gonna look closer for other signs and symptoms. And in this case, this is a rose. You can see the leaves are starting to distort. You can see insects on here, and these happen to be aphids, so sucking mouth parts. And then these little white things are the shed skins of the aphids. So sometimes when you get a, a sample, you may still have aphids on the plant, or maybe the aphids are gone because natural enemies, predators, and parasitoids killed them. Um, and all that's left behind is the distortion and then the shed skins. Okay. And in addition to that, aphids also leave behind honeydew. So they're phloem feeders, and they will excrete sticky substances onto the leaves or the stems, and you'll get this honeydew. And sometimes a black uh, mold will grow on that honeydew. So, so all of these things together tell you it's aphids. And if you know what the plant is, you can figure out which aphid it is. Here's another type of distortion. It's called galling. And there's an insect called an adelgid with a sucking mouth part. It, when the a delgid starts to feed on the tip of this branch. Um, it injects hormones, and then the hormones tell the plant to grow. And it tells the plant to grow in an abnormal way. And basically, it makes this little home for the insect to develop in. So the adelgids live and reproduce inside this gall. When they're ready to emerge, the gall opens up, and you'll see these little holes, and the adults emerge out and fly off and start again. Another type of distortion is um, leaf cupping, sorry, leaf cupping on boxwoods. So you'll see a normal boxwood leaf is relatively flat, but when you have these psyllids sucking mouth parts feeding on that actively growing tissue, it causes them to cup. Okay, so you'll see cupping of the new growth. But the other thing that psyllids produce is a wax. So you'll also see a waxy material on the new growth. So cupping, wax on boxwood, you're gonna be able to figure out that's boxwood psyllid. Then you can learn more about boxwood psyllid and how to best manage it. Another type of um, galls are leaf galls caused by areophyte mites. And you can see here, these pretty little um, galls emerging from the leaf. You guys have probably seen this. If you cut the gall open, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of little areophyte mites growing in here. And depending on the type of mite, the gall may look slightly different. So sometimes they're red, sometimes they're different colors, um, sometimes they're more flat, sometimes they're, they protrude like these. There's also another group of insects um, that cause galls, and these are cynipid wasps. So a type of hymenoptera, little wasps, very common on oak trees. You get different types of leaf galls, um, and the different species of wasp will cause a different type of gall. You cut those galls open, and again, you see the immatures inside the galls. So these are different galls caused by these little cynipid wasps. You also get galls on stems. So you can have um, leaf stems like you see here on um, galls on stems, um, which can also damage plant. Leaf galls usually don't cause damage that warrants control. Some of your stem galls, like this horned oak gall, can cause dieback from the branches out and ultimately tree death. Some of these other galls, they're usually not that abundant. You just prune them out and you're fine. Then dieback, wood boring insects. 
root feeding insects and sometimes sucking insects and gall making insects, the stem gall is like I just mentioned. Here you see dieback of the branches. You're gonna look at these trees, see if it's, if it's an abiotic cause, and then you're gonna look for signs and symptoms of potential biotic causes. So for example, here we see a lot of frass, sawdust frass material at the bottom of the tree and on these, these suckers underneath. That suggests that there's a boring insect in there. It bores under the bark and it pushes the frass out as it chews on the, on the bark and excretes the frass and it fall, comes out of the hole. Cracking of the bark also indicates boring insects. The different galleries, different types of insects cause different patterns of the galleries that you're gonna see under that bark. So wood boring, insects can cause dieback. There are also sucking insects that can cause this type of dieback. So again, you're looking for your abiotic causes, and if not, then you're looking for your signs and symptoms of biotic causes. And in this case, there's sucking insects called scales, and that was an oak. There's one called obscure scale. And when I looked at the branches of these trees and down here, I saw hundreds and hundreds of these obscure scale on there. Sucking insects, sucking so much sap out of the tree that it was causing dieback. Root feeding insects, so insects that feed on the roots or that girdle at the base of the crown, they feed on the, the bark at the base of the plant at the crown. Um, the larvae of weevils do this. So weevils, remember the leaf notching beetles, the larvae are down in the soil feeding on the roots or feeding on the crowns. You, you get that type of damage and you're gonna get dieback of the branches and ultimately death of the tree. And then the last category are, um, the, the um, signs, so insect products. And insect products can include things like honeydew, which then grows sooty mold, and I'll show you pictures. These are insects that cause that type of damage. Fecal spots, we talked about lace bugs and thrips causing those. The sawdust or frass type material by borers. Um, there's silk or protective cases that are built, often caterpillars. Some insects produce wax or spittle. And these are many of our sucking insects, our bugs, our hoppers, the scales, aphids, um, pitch tubes, which are produced when bark beetles are feeding, and then um, eggs or shed skins. And we saw pictures of some of these already. Sorry, wrong key. So here, these are this is an example of honeydew on a leaf. Okay. So there's a group of insects that feed on phloem, phloem feeding sucking insects. Here we have a close-up of an aphid. The mouth part is in the stem, tapping into the phloem sap, sucks a lot of sap up, and then it excretes this honeydew substance, which is very high in sugars that the insect doesn't need. It drips down onto lower leaves, onto the bark and branches of the trees, onto patios underneath, um, onto cars underneath. You get this heavy layer of, of sooty mold, I mean honeydew, which is then this black sooty mold grows on top. But I want you to remember whenever you see this honeydew or sooty mold, a flag should go off in your head that it's gonna be one of these groups of insects that are causing that honeydew. This year, you guys are gonna get a lot of questions about honeydew and sooty mold and lanternflies because lanternflies are this new invasive species that has been in Maryland for a couple of years, but now it's spreading even more um, and it's like a big aphid almost because it excretes lots of honeydew. So more than aphids excrete. So you will get questions on this, but you see the honeydew or the sooty mold, it's gonna be one of these groups of insects. So you look for other signs or symptoms from those insects. If you see ants on a plant, that usually means they're feeding on the honeydew produced by one of those um, honeydew producing insects. Some insects leave behind eggs. You might not see the insect anymore, but you may see their eggs. These are aphid eggs on white pine, white pine aphid. Shed skins, these are shed skins from aphids. Again, aphids gonna be on newer growth. You usually don't have one or two aphids. You usually have hundreds of aphids, so you'll have lots of shed skins. And you may see aphids, you may not by the time you get the sample. I showed you a shed skin of a leaf hopper. These are shed skins of lace bugs, but again, you've got shed skins along with fecal spots. And if you flip the leaf over, stippling. So you're gonna know that's a lace bug. Wax, some insects produce wax. Some insects produce spittle, okay? And the immatures of spittle bugs 
are inside this mass of, of spittle, um, a frothy substance that the um, insect produces, and it's a protective covering for those insects. Some insects produce, make protective cases. A lot of times these are caterpillars, so bagworms web together plant material. They have a very strong webbing. The caterpillar lives inside there, sticks its head out, and feeds on the foliage, but the caterpillar itself is mostly protected by this, protected by this bag. We, there are lots of caterpillars that produce tents, also a protective covering. And then some of our bark beetle, beetle bark boring, bark beetle boring insects will result in what's called a pitch tube being produced by the plant. So when the beetle bores in, the plant um, pushes resin to that hole, trying to drown out the beetle. Okay, and kill it that way. So those are other signs of a boring insect. In addition to sawdust that you may or may not see with some boring insects. Okay, so, so those are all the different categories of damage. And what I'd like to do now real quick is to um, do some practice diagnostics. I think this will help you guys um, with your um, plant clinics and, and identifying other types of problems the types of problems that you're gonna see. So we're gonna do some practice diagnostics. And remember, the idea is you identify the plant, you determine if the plant is healthy or damaged or stressed, you're looking for signs and symptoms, and then you're gonna use your resources to um, diagnose the problem and then come up with a management plan or recommendations to, um, to, to manage that problem, okay? So you guys are master gardeners, you're, let's pretend you're working at a plant clinic this morning and your clients are either gonna bring you in samples and or pictures of damage and what they're seeing at their homes. Um, and they want you to tell them what the problem is and what they should do about it, okay? So again, you're gonna look for those signs and symptoms. You're gonna um, try to identify the causal agent and you're gonna ask questions. So what I'd like you to do at this point is to, you can unmute if you want and hopefully it won't get too crazy because I know there are a lot of you guys out there. Um, I'm, and I want you to tell me, um, try to help me. I'm your client. I just brought you in um, a picture or a sample of my plant. And I want you to tell me what's wrong with it. I've been seeing all these yellow spots on my leaves of, of this shrub. So somebody asked me a question. What's the first question you wanted to ask me? What's the shrub? What's the shrub? What kind of plant is it? Does anybody recognize this plant? It looks like Pachysandra. Looks no, like Pachysandra. not Pachysandra. No. No. Euonymus. Euonymus. Yeah, it's Euonymus. Okay. And so we're looking at it from a distance, but do you guys want to see it closer up? Yes. Okay. So, I'm sorry. I also have this picture. Now, I'm going to tell you there are two types of damage going on here. I'm yeah. only focusing on these yellow spots, the discoloration damage. I'm not thinking about the, the leaf notching damage, okay, for this particular example. So ignore the leaf notching and just think about the, the discoloration that you're seeing. So there's the little white specks there. Okay, little white specks. Okay. Stippling a, a sucking insect. Yep, sucking insect, very good. So want to see even a closer up because some of you guys will have microscopes or hand lenses, right? To look closer yeah. at these things. Yeah, yeah. So let's get Close a closer up. look. Okay. Oh. Amazing. Are those white flies? No. That's a yes, scale. Looks like an not. oyster shell scale. Yeah. Yep. The, mm -hmm. the brown things are scales. Yep. See these brown things? They're kind of oyster shell. These are scales. So now you know, you've got it down here, you got it down to a sucking insect. And if you didn't know more than that, you could Google euonymus on a scale, insect, yellow spots. But now you actually you know it's a scale. So you can Google euonymus scale. And what's gonna come up is the most common scale on euonymus is euonymus scale. And these are the females, <laughs> these brown ones are the female scale covers. These white ones are the male scale covers, mm -hmm. okay? And then you're gonna be so excited because you're gonna say, yes, that's it, yeah. I've diagnosed it, okay? And then you go to your resources and you're gonna figure out when the crawler stage of those scales are active and you're gonna make recommendations on the best way to manage that, that scale, right? So good job, guys, you got that one. Let's try another one. I've just brought you in this sample. It's a rose. 
Okay. Please. You know, it's a rose. You don't even have to ask me. And if a oh, client oh, tells you what a plant is, do you, if a client tells you what a plant is, the ID, do you always believe it? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Very right. seldom. <laughs> yeah. No, no. So you want to confirm, mm -hmm. you want to confirm, but you are right. This is a rose. And what are you seeing? What type of damage are you seeing on here? Etching. Etching. So you could right now go to your resources and Google rose and etching. I usually go to Google images and I'll put rose and etching damage and see what comes up in the pictures, right? Um, so the other thing is you can ask the client if they've seen anything else on it or send them back to look for other signs and symptoms too. So um, when I was looking at my rose this morning, I saw this etching damage like you called it. But when I flipped over the leaves, I saw these guys. Oh. Mm -hmm. So, so again, there's fresh. etching, rose, rose look at the fly. pictures. Yeah. A soft lie, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So if you Google soft lie or you Google rose and etching, it's going to list probably soft lies would be the main thing that would come up. And there are a few different species, so you could look at the soft fly and figure it out. Um, and if, if you miss this diagnosis or if the client missed this, this is actually what those roses will look like after a bit of time of not controlling and managing those soft flies. Okay, so this is pretty significant etching to the point where it's causing this damage on the plant. Okay, so again, you go to your resources, you figure out the biology, the life cycle when it's active and what the best management is. And for this one, if you can catch these guys here when you're getting this etching damage and find them and just smush them, you'll do really good. But if you miss that, you may have to come in with like an horticultural oil or something and spray the undersides of the leaves if you end up having lots of them on your, on your plant. But squishing them is a good way to control it. But you can find that out from your resources. Okay, let's do another one. Boxwood. Boxwood. Yes, I agree. That's boxwood. Leaf miners. Leaf miners. How do you know it's leaf miners? What are you seeing? The little mines. Little mines, right? These little things that look like blisters, right? Little blotched mines. Sometimes they're brown like this. Sometimes they're just bumpy like this. How could you have them? That's a leaf. And you have cupped leaves. You have some cupping. Cup, yeah, cupping some leaves. Cupping. So I, I might have something else on here, right? Yeah. So you know you've got insects on here. If you Google boxwood and insects or boxwood and pests, it's gonna come up with a, a list of things because boxwoods actually have a whole bunch of pests. So for insects and mites, it can be leaf miners. It can be the psyllid that causes the, the cupping of the leaves and you would see wax with that too. It could be spider mites. There's a boxwood spider mite, which would cause the stippling. And many times I see all three of those on a boxwood at the same time. Okay. But again, you figure out what it is, you look at the signs, you try to figure out, diagnose what the causal agent is. You can open some of those leaf mines, and if it's yeah. the right time of year, you will see the larvae and or the pupil in there, pupae in there. That's a pre pupae And then in the spring, those pupae wiggle out of the leaf and they emerge out of their pupil case as adults. And in the spring and April, you'll see lots of adults. They look like little orange mosquitoes flying around your boxwoods. So these are all signs and symptoms. And again, you go and you get the information as to, to what's, what the problem is. Okay. So um, I have one more. Do you want to do one more or do you want to yeah. close up? Do one more. Okay. One more. Um, all right. Oh. I, I just brought you in this sample. It's pretty messy. Um, you guys can hold it. I don't want to hold it anymore. It's, it's getting my hands all sticky and messy. It's uh, it looks like a camellia with scale with uh, sooty mold on it. No, it's high. Okay. Holly. 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 Right, somebody, yeah, holly. somebody else give me some answers here too. So holly. Yep. Camellia holly. was a good guess, but it's actually a holly. Okay. So good guess. That's so now you're going to Google, yeah, what signs and symptoms are you seeing? Sooty mold. So what does that tell you? You see the sooty mold. Is that a chewing insect or a sucking? Sucking. 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 And it does that sucking insect? Sooty mold is on the honeydew. It would have been sooty mold on a honeydew. That's correct. Exactly. Right? So you may not see the shiny, sticky honeydew because the sooty mold is, is grown all over it and covering it. 
So, but when you see the honeydew and or the sooty mold, that tells you it's a sucking insect, but what else does it tell you about that sucking insect? Does it feed on the cells? Oh, oh. yeah, the phloem. Oh, it's xylem or phloem. Phloem, yeah, the phloem sap. So it the sucking mouth taps into the phloem vessel, sucks up the sap. So was there just a, a, a handful of insects that could cause that, that are phloem feeders that I told you about? Yeah. Yeah. So what you would do is you would pull out that handout that I gave you and say, what did Paula say those insects were? And you could look and see what groups of insect cause them. You can also, you already know it's a sucking insect. You know, it's a phloem feeder. You know, it's a holly. You can go online. You can go to your resources, put in that information, and it's going to come up with a list of potential causal agents, right? But if you look more for other signs and symptoms, you're going to see this on the underside of the leaf. Gale. It's a scale type insect, or you know, you may see this and this. These are all things that you're seeing on the undersides of that in, of that holly, those holly leaves. Okay. Cottony so all signs and scale. symptoms. Okay. So this is what we call cottony camellia or taxis scale. It's, wow. it's the same scale, just two names. You can see here are the scales, the, the younger scales that have settled onto the, the mid vein of the leaf and other areas. Then the adult female will produce this oversac, this waxy oversac. So the presence of the scale, the presence of the waxy oversac, the honeydew, the sooty mold, the host plant all tell you it's cottony camellia scale or cottony taxis scale. So then again, you go and you look for signs and symptoms. I mean, and then you go and you look up what's the biology, how many generations, when's the susceptible, what's the susceptible stage? What are my management options for this? Okay, and when should those options be applied? And then that's the information that you're going to recommend to your clients. Okay. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer questions. I know we're getting late on time, so I do I'm have here to. I do have a few questions that have come in via the chat, Paula. Um, okay. We'll just okay. ask a couple of them quickly. Um, sure. Is there a pest predictive calendar that is particularly good for vegetable gardening um, and pests related to vegetable gardens? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I work mainly in, in ornamentals. Um, so our pest predictive calendar is geared towards kind of commercial or towards horticultural plant, ornamental woody trees and shrubs, and maybe some flowers too. But um, I don't <laughs> know of one for vegetables. Um, I know um, there is a fruit and vegetable newsletter that's put out every week or every two weeks through extension. So you might want to Google the fruit and vegetable newsletter. I know that's a good one. Um, another resource for you guys for pests on those, those types of plants. So um, I would do that. So you, if you just Google the UME fruit and vegetable newsletter, you should come up with information on that. And, and I don't um, know, I don't know if they have a predictive calendar, but I do know that would be a good resource to help you with some of those types of problems. Great. Um, a couple of us wondered, um, just to make things even a little more complicated, are there insects that are pests in one of their life stages, but are actually beneficials in another life stage? Oh, good question. Yes, there are. Butterflies. <laughs> Butterflies, yes. Mm -hmm. That's a great example. Butterflies as adults, they feed on the nectar from the flowers and as they're feeding, they're picking up pollen. Um, and then, so they're pollinators. That's one. Um, Let's see, how many of you guys are familiar with click beetles? Uh, click beetles, they can be little brown ones uh, usually, and if you pick them up, they will click and they uh -huh. flip over. So if you put them on their back, they have this clicking mechanism and they flip over. Well, as adults, they can be predators, but some species are actually pests of like potatoes and some of our other root type of vegetables. That's another one. That's another one, Mike. Some sort. And just one, one quick follow-up to that. Um, mm -hmm. the, the presentation has been wonderful on identification and um, working us through that. Um, where would you point us, um, 
regarding the best ways to give advice to people on treatment, staying within IPM parameters um, after we've identified potential insect problems? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, go back in the slides that I had, and there was a section where I talked about resources, and there was the IPM um, bulletin put out by um, Mike Raup and John Davidson. So it's, it's um, managing um, insects of trees and shrubs and IPM approach um, in the landscape. Was, the title was something like that, Managing Landscape Pests of Trees and Shrubs. And um, that's a really good IPM resource. It talks about what the pest looks like, what the damage looks like. It has chemicals in there, but those chemicals are for commercial applicators, not for homeowners. Um, so you can not pay attention to those, but it talks about when to monitor, um, when the damage, the vulnerable stages are there, and then some other IPM tactics like mechanical, pruning, removing. Um, I like when oil. you suggested smashing. I thought that was a great, yes, I need to teach that one to my grandchildren. <laughs> yes, it's always good to get the kids involved, yes. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good resource. And then the Home and Garden Information Center um, is another really good resource for, for information. Um, and then other extension um, types of, of um, sites are good too. Well, I, on behalf of all of us, Paula, I want to thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, the slides are very helpful. In case anyone missed it in the chat, um, Paula's slides are available on our Master Gardener website. If you go to our April meeting and scroll down into it, you can um, see the slides again there. So. Again, on behalf of all of us, thank you, Paula, and I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. Uh, excuse me, can I just say one more thing, Steve, before you start? Sure. Um, Mike Ralph wrote this really nice paper for, uh, for a magazine on diagnostics. Um, I will send um, Steve and Renu, I think you're the one who puts these things up, um, a link to that. And you guys are a PDF of it. And um, it's a really good um, article that it's an overview of diagnostics. So a lot of what I talked about today, but it also brings it all together. So I think that might be helpful too. So I'll send you a link to that and you guys can share that with the master gardeners too. Great. Thank you, Paula. It's wonderful. Thanks guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay.